Going here, to continue with uh, Nagbiwa. Nagbiwa is the um, really father of a lot of the northern groups. So if you hear about the uh, the Moshi up in Burkina Faso or the Dagombas, uh, Mamprusis, a lot of those groups in the north trace their lineage down through Nagbiwa. Oh, wow. And so uh, my my children, they're they're uh, Brunis. They also trace through Nagbiwa. In fact, my son sometimes, he hasn't done it a long time, does a full history of Nagbewa with all of the uh, names of all of the sons and the daughters mm. and how they spread out to different places in Ghana and Burkina. So, mm. so when we talk about the Gaz, we, we have Takitawia is the main one there, uh, Tugbe, which will change the spelling on uh, Tugbe yeah. Sri, and then we have for the Northerners there and then for the Akans. Okay. Okay, we have Osei yeah. Tutu. Okay, please. Yes. I think I, I always come in here, but I, I want you, uh, you, you, you're supposed to do this one for me. If you can uh, add uh, Jerry John Rollins. Jerry John Jerry Rollins, Rollins is yes. coming. Yeah. Don't okay, thank you. In fact, Jerry John Rollins uh, is going to get uh, his own <laughs> place to start with. So oh, wow. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank I, you. Haven't, I haven't continued. Painting yeah, for a while. Wow, okay. You know, we got a lot of people, but here in Ghana, yeah. You know, uh, although you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. have yeah. their yeah. you know descent on that point. But we'll mm -hmm. do it. So anyway, that <laughs> was at uh, Nagbewa. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ose Tutu, uh, uh, it's the first Ashantihini, yes. the first king of the Ashantis, and. Um, there's a long story about a Confanoche, mm -hmm. who was yeah, the one who brought the golden stool, uh, the golden stool representing all that's royal and all that is powerful in the uh, Akan, especially uh, the Shanti Kingdom. Yes. So uh, this is one of the Akans that we decided to put up here. I've also read that a Confanoche, actually, the Noche is the same Noche that uh, these people came, the uh, Ebes came, uh, 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 so yes. he's a Confe Noche, yes. and that's the same Noche that's actually in Togo. Yes. I read that, so I was always thinking that a Confe Noche himself was actually another Ashanti, or at least another Akan, but some people are saying that he's actually in Ebe. No, a Confe Noche not from Ebe, he's from Eastern region, Akuyapim. Yeah, yeah, but they're saying from Okay, my man, come. It's going to be a relationship. This was just a, something that I was reading, and I don't know how to, you know, they were saying, you know, although a comfort noche comes from Aukugwa. But they said, but before that, he was actually from Nyoche, the same Nyoche that these people came from the Anlo. So they, they say there was a comfort yeah, of Nyoche. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if that's true or not. Well, that is what the debates oh, carry okay. on. So yeah. it's not. Uh, the Ewes also claim he is an Ewe mm -hmm. who is a twin. Okay. Yeah, they believe he's a yes, twin. Yeah, yeah, and then the yeah. twin, and they challenged the father, and then he moved and crossed, and then went all the way to Dentra. At the time, Dentra was playing, and they met King Osei Tutu. At, they, they become friends, mm -hmm. and then they moved to Asante. But originally from Aokugwa in the Eastern region. Ah, okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, all right, that's interesting. We have to do more research on this because that's very interesting to me. Uh, by the way, when my when they did the DNA test of our people, mm -hmm. I found out that my DNA came from the Volta region. Uh -huh. So now I have to find out more. Uh, okay. I need to learn the language, but you know. I'm still yeah. Did you speak any? I'm all? still struggling with this bit. English. <laughs> okay. All right. Thomas Sankara. Uh, a lot of people in Ghana know Sankara. A lot of them know because he was one of Jerry Rollins' close associates. But also he's known in, in Africa as being one of the uncorruptible young leaders who came along. Uh, he was known for, you know, a lot of things, not just not being corrupt. You know, he, he's one of the first to elevate women into high positions of authority. And uh, of course, we think that the reason they got rid of him is because he refused to pay all of this odious debt that the IMF and the World Bank and these institutions put on him. And, and they had to get rid of him as an example to the other ones who were thinking about um, not paying all of that odious debt back.
young brave man. Now we, we got these sisters. I, I like to get the young girls too mm -hmm. to stand here sometimes and take a picture. We always choose someone who looks, I say, most like a Menorinus. A Menorinus, and we talked about ancient Kemet. Well, now we know when we got to about 60 BC, this time frame, the Romans are now in charge of Egypt. And it's being called Egypt by then, not Kemet. But the Romans thought they could just go south, you know, and penetrate southern Egypt, Egypt and northern Sudan of today. But they, so Cush was there, but they ran into a Menorinus. So this is Caesar and his army, the great Roman army. Once again, all of the children know everything about Roman army, what they wore, mm -hmm. the greatest army. And I said, but when they got to the Menorinus, they got stopped cold in their tracks, went to war. She won, pushed them back north, and they maintained their sovereignty, these Kandakis or queens of Kush, for another 300 years. So it's good for them to know that not only was the Roman army defeated, but it was defeated by an African female general and her soldiers. That's a Menorinus. Menelik. Menelik II. Uh, Menelik II, he's here because, uh, as, he, as a lot of you know, Ethiopia was the only place that was never um, colonized, at least through force. And for large measure, from, because of the foresight of Menelik, who was able to train his people, get his weaponry, and he saw what had happened in all of these other African nations in terms of having been colonized. So he decided not to let that happen. So the Battle of Adua, 1895, where he was able to run out the Italians and maintain sovereignty for that group. Malcolm X, our people, you all know Malcolm. Uh, uh, these children, they focus on the X sometimes. They want to know why is the X, and I explain to them, and I take that as an opportunity. Sometimes we even do little skits uh, upstairs, and we'll be doing them in this building here real soon. But um, talking about how we lost our surnames. You know, why I'm Johnson and why someone else is Williams or Smith or whatever it is, or Gonzalez. So I explained to them how we lost our surnames and how Malcolm would not allow his surname Little to be used. And then I tell them something about just his leadership among us. But the skit basically, uh, what we usually do in the skit is we take the children and then we all give them a, a local surname, like out here maybe Nati. Then as they go get it in Brazil, We'll take one from the family, then we'll get to Trinidad, we'll take another one. And each time, naming that person that we've taken off the ship, either a Portuguese name, Spanish name, French name, Dutch name, English name, but they were all Nate at the beginning of the month. By the end of the month, they're scattered at all these places with all of these European surnames. And so this, and for the children, they, it's hard for them to even imagine that this happened, but, but it happened. Okay, Tetsue, we know coming down from uh, the, the great Zulu line of warriors, he comes down uh, Shaka's line. Of course, he had a lot of success uh, fighting the British, but of course, the British, this is where you really saw the weaponry come into effect. Their advanced weapons versus our disciplined soldiers. And at the end, the weaponry won out, but Tetsue gave it all he had. Akhenaten, or Amenhotep IV, uh, he's known really as the father of monotheism. That's where you'll see him, like if you look him up in the books. Actually, it wasn't so much he was the father of monotheism, uh, but he had practiced it a different way. Aten meaning the sun, so the sun kind of became uh, one of the central uh, focuses of the religion. Now, uh, Sigmund Freud, some of you know, uh, wrote Moses and Monotheism, basically talking about the fact that Moses is an Egyptian, and of course he was an Egyptian sometime during this 18th dynasty. Now, now Freud didn't get into this part, but you know Freud didn't say so. Therefore, the Ten Commandments and all of that stuff came comes from our the African tradition of the 42 uh, admonitions of Maat. But there's enough in there to realize that uh, even Sigmund Freud knew that the story is being told about the the. Uh, beginning of these Western, so-called Western religions was not the one that popularly been told. Bob Marley, I don't think I have to say too much. Bob is the man. Anywhere in the world you can find out here, Bob Marley. Uh, Wangari Mathai, this is the sister who they uh, gave the Nobel Prize for planting all of the trees. I have her here really more for her political outlook than her ec ecological 
uh, achievements, although she should be known for both. Sing Bay PA, of course, uh, so those of you who read Amistad or saw Amistad, this is uh, the one who led the, the rebellion, and the, he's the one that uh, was able to try to bring the ships back. And the children here want to know, you know, why exactly was he trying to come back to Africa, you know? So I always trick them. I said, well, you know, and they were right on the coast of America. As far as they're concerned, well, she, they, she could have just jumped off and swam, you know? So no, at that time, Africans knew where home was, knew where they wanted to be, and had no desire to be in the Western Hemisphere. Thing they did. Fred did Hampton. You did you find out that he, if he was crew? Was he crew coming out of Sierra Leone? He, he could have been crew. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, Fred Hampton, you know, the chairman. So I let them know about uh, what Fred Hampton stood for in terms of just being a young man with a powerful voice, uh, killing him not just because he was a powerful voice among African-American, quote unquote, but of course across the board he was influencing Latino, white, and all of the rest of them. But uh, his son was here, Fred Hampton Jr. So he took some nice pictures and he, uh, you know, gave us some of his perspectives. Uh, Maharero, uh, Maharero was uh, the one who tried very hard to uh, reduce the amount of killing, murder, and just wholesale genocide against the Herero and actually the Namas also by the Germans when they had colonized Namibia, what, what today we call Namibia, Southwest Africa. Uh, so it's interesting, if you look into these Germans who, who did these terrible massacres, you'll find out that some of these things, these work camps and uh, all the ways they did, these are the same techniques that they used in World War II uh, on the genocide there. And if you look into it further, you'll even find some of the names. So let's say some of the generals and colonels and leaders and politicians, you can find their sons or nephews or grandsons, you know, during World War II, doing the same thing in Germany that their fathers did in Namibia. So we need our story told about this genocide against our people there by the Germans. Oliver Tambo, of course, he had the same problem. He was kicked out of uh, South Africa, like Mary Makeba, for about three decades, trying to keep the whole anti-apartheid fervor alive and keep the ANC relevant. Augustino Neto, uh, you know, they call it, they talk about Renaissance man. We say these are Imhotep man. Uh, he's a, not only a doctor and a poet and a writer, but of course he was leading the uh, anti-colonial forces against the Portuguese there in Angola and was the first president after uh, independence. Uh, Zabith is another one who's not very well known. This young girl, starting at about nine or 10 years old in Haiti, who ru rushed to escape the plantations. So when she escaped, they would get her, they would beat her, uh, they would brand her, they'd done everything, torture this child, and she'd run away again, over and over. And so the point is, she had some of that kind of sublime madness that no matter what you do to her, her desire to be free of that slave plantation, that oppressive slave culture, was enough to keep her running away when others had, had succumbed to the, to the depression. So this is this young girl. They finally, she finally did die on one of the final escapes because she ended up bleeding to death while she was trying to escape the metal thing that they had caught her in. Baby Ray, Baby Ray, uh, in addition to being a uh, Colgate model, <laughs> he's also a bad, bad brother. <laughs> Sierra Leone of the Timne people. Now here's what the British used to do. They had what they call hut tax wars. So basically you've been living in your hut for generations. The British come in and they say, look, we need you to do all of this work around here. Basically, we want to enslave you in your own land. And of course, the people will say no. Now, this is all in the context of the British having the guns. So they said, listen, here's what you do. You have to pay a tax on your hut. Pay it in pounds sterling, pay it in whatever it is, shillings. Pay it however we want, but you have to pay a tax on that hut. So how do you earn the tax? Well, you can earn the tax by working for us, being a slave in your own... So uh, Baby Ray said, excuse me, let me understand this. You want to tell you? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, be right back. Came back and 
his warriors and they got it on. <laughs> so Baby Ray fought valiantly against the British. Now, of course, again, they had the guns. They ended up capturing him in the end. But the point is, our men didn't all lay down. Our women didn't all lay down. You know, we struggled, we fought, we tried to hold on to our sovereignty the best we could, uh, given the tools that we had. And it will be that way again. Mm -hmm. uh, Felix Mumi, this is another one. He wasn't a very famous person. He was like a number two or three man in the, uh, the new revolutionary government of Cameroon. Uh, he made the mistake of going to Geneva, which of course Switzerland is the neutral and all of that stuff, to negotiate some terms of you know, their relationship. And while he was there, they poisoned him at dinner with thallium. So, uh, and they, they actually was a kind of a mistake. They had poisoned him. They put poison in one drink. He didn't drink it. They'd gone to the restroom before he left that evening. Uh, there was another one that they prepared in haste. And he actually drank that one. And so that poisoned him and he died, you know, there in Geneva, painful poison death. What they intended for him to do is drink the first one, which only had enough poison to kill him like a couple of weeks down the line when he was back home and they could say, but they overdosed him, so they killed him right on the spot so everyone knew they murdered him right there in Geneva. So it was a big case. As I always say, you know, the European at the time being the judge, jury, and executioner, he ended up getting away with it. But if you look up on, the story is on the internet. Uh, the people in his country tried to at least do some kind of documentary tribute there. Uh, Sekouhouni, another one of our great fighters against the Boers, who of course, you know, were the, uh, the come from uh, Holland, the Dutch Afrikaners. And having some success with the Boers, he ended up then having to, of course, fight the British. And, um, Unfortunately, this is another one of those cases where he was trying, uh, he had a half-brother and they had problems with secession and who was going to be where, and the guy sold him out, you know, with the British, and at the end, he has ended up on the throne, and of course, you can imagine the British let him sit on that throne for about 15 minutes, they got rid of him and went on about the business, but they were able to use each other then and now, you know, oftentimes to establish, to you know, for their own agenda. Now, Honda, you may have heard of uh, Shimarenga, Wars of Resistance uh, against the British there in Zimbabwe. Well, the spiritual force behind the first Shimarenga was uh, Nsista Nahanda. Nahanda was um, eventually caught, but you know, sometimes they send these people to exile and they do different things. They didn't take any chances with Nahanda, they just hung her right now. But uh, this sister, there's a few sisters I met around the U.S. who are also going by the name of Nahanda, as Zimbabwe. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, if, if the children have heard of anyone from America, yes, you know. it's him. And I don't even have to tell you what they heard. Yes. Right. So what I do is, uh, when I bring them here, I, I tell them a little bit more about that other king, the one that they had to kill, right. you know, and why. Because some of the children ask me, why did they kill him? And I say, it was. I tell him, you know, what he was standing for in the end against American militarism. And him and Malcolm X had came together, that was it. Yeah, it could have come. So that's Martin Luther King. Hatshepsut. Uh, of course, I like, especially the young sisters, to know that we had female pharaohs of ancient Kemet. So we had these sisters. And so Hatshepsut was well known for her trade and her travels. Uh, she's gone as far as Punt, Somalia, even up into what some people call the Middle East. She really had um, a wide range of activities, trading, and also, uh, if you ever look online, you can see the uh, temples that were built in her honor, um, hewn out of solid stone on the mountain. I mean, it's incredible. You look at it, and you realize they carved this out of this mountainside. So if you ever get a chance, look on your thing for Hatshepsut Temple, and you won't believe what you see. Just a marvel of architecture. Uh, Nubian. Uh, Around 641, now remember again in ancient Kemet, the Arabs that you see there now didn't come until around this time, 640, you know. So, which means that when all of the things of consequences were happening in Egypt, pyramids being built, writing started, mathematics started, all of this medicine, all of the wonders of ancient Kemet all happened 
two, three thousand years before the first Arab ever showed up. But now uh, in Egypt, you're seeing all these pictures of these, and even the tour guides, from what I'm yeah. told, they're telling you that the Arabs were the ones who did all of this. You know, and the Arabs weren't involved. So when they finally did come to Egypt, Kemet, they decided, kind of like the Romans did with the uh, Amenarenus' case, they thought they were just going to go ahead and push their way south into Nubia. You know, Kush Nubia is basically the same area in the Nile Valley, northern Sudan, southern Egypt. But instead of uh, Amenarenus, who'd been gone for, uh, you know, 700 years, they ran into Kaliterat and his people. And they fought the Arabs and sacked the Arabs, fought them to a standstill, forced them into a treaty called the Bakht. The Bakht lasted 700 years. So at this time, and we, that's why if you look and you try to look for a lot of Arab history from about this time to about 13 something, you'll see that uh, because of what they did here, they bottled the Arabs up, you know, in the northern Africa for a long, long time. And uh, he had part to do with this. So now, 700 years. Imagine us now having any kind of treaty that we could enforce for 700 days. So this gives you the idea of the balance of power. And then you can also start looking at the weaponry, too. We're dealing mainly now with strategy, uh, reasonably comparable weapons. And when we had that, we had no problems. Just when we became outgunned, that's when we uh, lost it and we never really caught up. Muhammad Ali, greatest of all times, you know, I thought more of the youngsters would have heard of Ali. Some of the older teachers would have heard of them who, you know, used to, used to fight, used to follow boxing. But uh, Muhammad Ali, of course, I let him know not only about him being the greatest boxer, but of course him refusing to, to uh, go to Vietnam and be, you know, be a token for the American army. The great Muhammad Ali. Uh, Lacho Jok, Lacho Jok, he's one of the heroes in Senegal against the French. Uh, he fought as hard as he could to keep them from taking over his province or his nation of Kayor, C-A-Y-O-R, of which he was the Damo or the king. And so he and his sons and family fought the French to the death because the French wanted to run a railroad through the kingdom, of course, to extract minerals and all the things they could from the inside of the country. And uh, Latour said no. Uh, coming to Cuba, we got Antonio Maceo. When I first thought, saw this, I thought it was Maceo, like Maceo Parker, blow your horn. Yeah. Now, I always wondered if that's where Maceo got his name. But anyway, uh, Maceo was the general. He's not dressed in general garb here, but I like happen to like this picture more than some of the other ones that weren't as clear. He was the African general that led uh, the Cubans against the Spaniards in their war of liberation, war of independence against Spain. And so he's very well known and well regarded in Cuba from what I'm told. Uh, his nickname was the Bronze Titan. Maceo, blow your horn. <laughs> Patrice Lumumba. Lumumba is another one who actually didn't live that long after he got into power. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is he was trying to maintain um, uh, control over the resources, especially down in the um, Katanga region of what today is Congo. And of course the Western world wanted that available for plunder. And so that's when you get the Mobutus, who was actually one of his lieutenants at the time, but um, you know how they are. They, they turn when they get a chance. But another reason I have this is this is when I get a chance to talk to the students about the rubber exploitation in the Congo, you know, we lost something like eight to 10 million Africans harvesting rubber for King Leopold and the Belgians in Congo, where they would send your wife out, your wife would be with you, they send you out to get rubber. If you don't bring back your, your quota, they'll cut your arm, her hand off. Send you back, they'll take your daughter or son, cut their hands off. So there's, you, you can find pictures today yes. of the people just holding up all of these African hands as representing, uh, you know, the hands they took of people who did not meet their quota. So we're talking eight to 10 million Africans dead and none of our people know about it. None of our students here know about it in Africa. None of our students know about it in America. 
and you know we're crying over everyone else's tragedies right. and holocausts and this that and the other and you're forced to go see movies all of that but your own tragedy not mandatory to know about it so we have to change that we have to make sure our children know what it is even to the extent where they would take chocolate I don't know you know you can find the pictures where they were just making chocolates in the in the shape of hands and selling them all around Belgium fine chocolate in the in the in the form of an African hand this is uh, the people you're trying to imitate and you know you're waiting for their NGO to save you. It's all a game. And Kwabanika and Kwawa, he was uh, a strong fighter of the Hehe group in Tanzania. Uh, of course, he was struggling against the Germans. Unfortunately, when um, he was caught, the Germans took his head, which wouldn't have been so bad, but then they took it back to Germany. And they kept it in Germany for decades and decades, even when they lost the next wars. I think they get over to the British. I think the people of Tanzania eventually got the head back. But could you imagine? They're just holding the man's head in a glass box in Germany for show for decades and decades. You know what I mean? So what's that all about? You know, and our children, when they hear that, they're like, say that again? Yeah, yeah. You're trying to go to Germany, right? Didn't I see you standing in front of the German embassy trying to get a visa? Good luck with that one. Robert Mugabe. Okay, now uh, I have a one rule of thumb. The British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, say someone is a tyrant, a gangster, a criminal, and a low life. They move to the top of my chart on candidates for the wall. Because if they hate him, it's probably good that you love him. Uh, you know the reason they hate Mugabe because for a while Mugabe was their hero when he thought when they thought he was going to let them keep the land. So he went through that 10-year period from 1990, uh, you know, the, the uh, Lancaster, or Manchester Accords, where, you know, he was going to, but at the end of the day, he had to get the land back because the British reneged on their side of the deal. So once the man and his soldiers who were, you know, had fought for this land in the second Shimaranga War of Resistance, once they said, no, we got to have the land, and he became the world's demon. And that's why you can never hear anything good on from Mugabe, but you can hear something good from the people in Zimbabwe who have the land that they got back from the British. Now, some places they got Nobel Prizes, but no land. <laughs> Elijah Muhammad, now we, I don't have to tell everyone about Elijah Muhammad's uh, uh, problems, we'll call them that, because that has all been very well publicized. But what we forgot, what we have to be careful we don't throw the baby out with the wash water on this because if you look in America there's been nothing before or since that is close to a nation in terms of just some level of self uh, sustainability than the nation of Islam of this time you know you have to look at what they had not only were they taking the people out of the prisons you know their businesses the, the trucking all of this stuff bank all of the stuff they were doing uh, that in reality, there was no chance of having a nation really truly controlled by African people inside of America, that nation. But to the extent that we could or we tried, this is probably the best representation. Next to maybe Marcus Garvey, but Marcus Garvey was a global movement, while this one was really uh, in the U.S. Uh, now all of the children think this is Michael Jackson, you know, on one of the, on one of the, one of the earlier, earlier incarnations of Michael, right around Thriller, you know. So. But, but actually, it's Ida B. Wells. Now Ida B. Wells, as a lot of you know, is a, a staunch advocate of anti-lynching and uh, everything associated with it. She had people close to her, family, and rather who had been lynched, who had been through that. Um, of course, her life was always in danger, but you know, she basically had no fear. This is the time I also get to show the children when we go, and by the way, this building back here in the middle is where we're going to be <clears throat> doing all of this now. We tried to do it on this side with the restaurant, but the restaurant's going and it's noisy, but this will be dedicated to this. So what we'll do, what we do is we do a, a, a skit with her also, but I also show them a whole lot of the pictures you know, I'm sure some of you have seen 
these lynching pictures, and I usually have one with me, where the children and everyone are partying and having a good time. It's a wonderful weekend event for the family to hang African women and men, burn them to charcoal, and that's what they did for their entertainment. This is not something we have to guess about. We have literally dozens and dozens of pictures that they, because they would send them out as postcards. They would send them out, you know, uh, to show people. It's like today being on Facebook or Instagram. Right, right. You know, in those days, they'd send out the postcards showing them having a good time burning Africans. Okay, I gotta get my uh, machete out here and get this down. But anyway, we're keeping some people in the shade for a minute. John Akello, Akello, uh, out of Zanzibar, you know, the Omani Arabs were, you know, because it's not just a European affair, a whole lot of people were standing on our heads. Or as I showed you back with Khalidarat trying to uh, steal our land and sovereignty. The Omani Arabs were standing on the heads of the native Africans in Zanzibar for a long time. So finally, um, there was a revolt. They came up, the Afro Shariza party, uh, John Akello led the revolt. And it was a bloody revolt, but at least for that time, they were able to get control of their land and control of their, their uh, resources. So sometimes the, uh, you know, when you're trying to get your stuff back, it ain't always a pretty affair. And it certainly wasn't with John and Keller. Um, whoever that is, I'll call him back. Fela Kute, Fela Kute, let's talk about, um, Talk about some level of sublime madness. That's Brother Fella. They would arrest him. <laughs> they would jail him. They would do everything to Fella. As soon as he recovered from the last thing they do, he would write another song that was more insulting to the power base than the last one. There was nothing you could do with Fella Kute to kill his spirit. And I, every time I come here, what I always think about is Zabbat, the young girl in Haiti that I was saying. I mean, she'd run away. They would, you know, there's something about it is that, you know, that most of us just can't suffer that kind of pain and that kind of abuse, that kind of uh, pressure and torture. But some people, it seems to somehow even give them strength to fight harder the next time around. That was Brother Fela. Zumbi. Now, you know, the Portuguese, of course, they're taking a lot of people from Angola, from Congo area, and taking them to Brazil. Right? So even if you go to Brazil today, there are people in the mountains who still are speaking and uh, understanding languages out of Central Africa and also Yoruba from the Nigerian side. Mm -hmm. Well, in, uh, in Brazil, the Africans, when they escape, those Maroons, the places they escape to, they call Quilombos. Mm -hmm. Quilombos were their own miniature nation up and away from the British, I mean, in this case, the uh, Portuguese plantations. The longest lasting one, the most successful one, was led by Zumbi. It was almost a hundred years, it was called Palmari. So he wasn't the only one. I went to Brazil. I didn't quite make it all the way up there. We had some difficulties on the trip, but I at least got the feeling of the spirit of what it's like for those Africans to go in those mountains, establish their own nations, uh, replicate the culture and the food to the extent they could of what they had back home and then maintain that freedom. It's an amazing thing. Uh, speaking of Brazil, Nascimento, this uh, man was, he was an artist, he was a writer, historian, political scientist, and uh, I have him here just because when we were trying to understand what was going on in Afro-Brazil, he was always just, you know, one of these fountains of, of information and time and energy. Uh, Nujoma, he's the only one, as far as I know, is still alive. Uh, first, I was, this is an ancestral wall, but my man said he wasn't ready to go. So when we painted him, that's when I realized he was still alive. He's still here. But he's got his spot. And basically, you know, they had to fight against the South Africans because the South Africans are the ones who had, had colonized Namibia. And these are the Boers and all of these, of course. So he was, uh, you know, the leading fighter general and, of course, the first president of independent uh, Southwest Africa or Namibia. Booker T. Washington, this is another one. People are like, oh, what about Booker T? And, and, you know, the boys in this debate back and forth. I understand that, but you also have to understand Booker T was doing things that people didn't exactly know about. Booker T was sending resources to places that you wouldn't expect. Uh, Dr. Tyreen Wright wrote a book about Booker T, and you can really get a lot more information 
And plus, you know, Tuskegee and these places are still there. There's things that I read that Booker T said that I even cringe a little bit because I don't like the way they were said. So in the beginning, I, he never would have been a candidate, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But the more I checked and the more I watched, the more I thought about it, you know, he was trying to establish something practical. So I think we have to relook these people. They're, not, they're a lot more complex than, uh, you know, our debates about them mm -hmm. uh, uh, tend to show. My daddy's number one blues man, B.B. <laughs> King and Lucille. Mm -hmm. and I think you can see my artist kind of caught the spirit of that one. Yes. B.B. and Lucille were getting it done. Mm -hmm. so that's uh, my daddy liked when that's the only criteria I need. <laughs> right. <laughs> Walter Rodney, the great Walter Rodney. Now, oh, yes. as I mentioned around here, is that you start seeing a lot of the uh, people from the Caribbean, of course, who didn't have big nations, they didn't have these things, but they had a lot of big brains coming out of those places. So you have people like Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, some of these things. Brilliant, brilliant uh, writing, thinking, and uh, uh, this guy, you know, he taught in Africa, he wrote, he did everything. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in a political murder back home in Guyana, uh, but he's really one of our most, most brilliant thinkers, revolutionaries. Uh, Queen Amina, I always like the boys and the girls who remember that we had huge, huge empires, in this case, uh, this house of women in the northern part of uh, Nigeria. And uh, she, she was a cavalry riding, you know, what are riding and fighting from the cavalry. This woman had uh, what they call uh, Amina walls, which are just as far as the eye can see. Some of the remnants are still there, just outlining and circumscribing her empire. Very, very powerful queen, Amina. They did a, uh, I heard they did a Netflix or something, but they said it wasn't really that good, but I didn't say that. I didn't see it. But I've heard a couple of people say they didn't particularly like it. I, not that they weren't, uh, you know, trying to tell a story, but I just think it's, you know, sometimes you don't have the budget to do these things the way you like. Eduardo Manlani, Manlani uh, out of Mozambique. This is another case where, you know, he was already, I think he graduated from Northwestern, PhD, you know, all of this stuff in the U.S. He could have just hung around and had a good time, but he is a, a revolutionary freedom fighter in his mind, in his heart, in his soul. So he came back, established Free Limo. You saw Samora Michelle, who was his protege. Unfortunately, the way he died was uh, in a parcel bomb. Someone mailed something, he opened it, blew up and killed him. But um, just some of these Africans who have options to hide in safe places in the West or somewhere, but choose not to and choose to get out there and fight for who they know they are and what they should, what they should be doing. We have to always give them praise and credit. Uh, Garrett Morgan. No, I'm just to get a picture with that queen. Right. Where are you from there? Yeah, pull it, stop me. Also, also, sir, put Ah, okay. So this is. Uh, Okay, Getting some points, points. Some points in with the girl. <laughs> we got that translation. Yes. <laughs> now, now you can only do one because if you do another one, you're in trouble. <laughs> so only one, one woman. This is great. All right, <laughs> All right Garrett, Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan, of course, for some of us, we know he invented the traffic signal and the gas mask that the. Mm -hmm. that the uh, firemen wear and all that. So this is something I always like the children remember because these are something I know they see every day and they know. So, so I always tell them when your father's racing too fast through the lights, say, hey, hey, wait, daddy, black man invented this. So we have to slow down <laughs> and stop. That's Garrett Morgan. He got a little bit of process in his hair. <laughs> it's, you know, sign of the times. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about getting my conk back. <laughs> <laughs> Before it's too late. Uh, speaking of brilliance, France Fanon, um, Martinique. Uh, some of you have ever read The Wretched of the Earth. If you haven't, you have to read it um, because to me, it's one of the most brilliant writings because he gets, he, he's able to penetrate really, he's a psychiatrist by training. So he's really able to penetrate the subconscious and the behavior of Africans, you know, under the colonial system and how we respond even when we're trying to get out of the colonial system. And of course, some of the um, uh, 
um, let's say, uh, redemptive characteristics of well-placed violence when you're trying to get out from under uh, under oppression. So that's the great France for now. Once again, from the Caribbean. Chilimbwe of, of Malawi, of course, he was, uh, went to the U.S., a lot of these went to the U.S., and he became a, um, you know, theologian and got all of his degrees and all of that. And when he got back to Malawi and he could see that even with all of his uh, religious training and all of his degrees, he was still dealing with a completely irreligious, uh, immoral British administration. So he had to go back in the bush and do his work. John Chilimbwe. Um, at least he finally saw the light. Seiko Ture, a lot of the Ghanaians know Seiko Ture because he's the one who brought who brought uh, Kwame Nkrumah in as a co-president in Guinea after Nkrumah had been deposed from Ghana. Uh, I have him on the wall more so because when the colonization period was over, the French said, look, a lot of you, any of you former French colonies who want to be uh, stay part of the so-called French community with whatever benefits that is supposed to imply can stay on. Seiko Ture said you can take your French, your benefits and all the rest of it and go away. Of course the French tried to destroy the country where they, you know, they knocking down the telephone poles and digging up the, you know, the power lines and pouring stuff in the cement in the sewage. Anything they could do to destroy the... And so, you know, my man said, you know, we, we hate that you guys got to go away angry, but as long as you go away, it's okay, you know. <laughs> so he got rid of them, and they hated him ever since. And then it didn't help his case anymore to also bring in Krumen because that was uh, functional Pan-Africanism, at least they were trying to make it so. Uh, I mean, Césaire, I mean, Césaire, once again, Martinique, uh, I don't know if you all heard of the movement called Negritude, which was a, uh, a literary movement among uh, French speaking colonies, whether in the Caribbean or Africa, it's Leopold Senghor, Ami Césaire, um, uh, the other one from uh, Guadeloupe. Uh, anyway, they started that. But even more so, he was really the intellectual godfather of a whole lot of these African, French-speaking Africans around Paris, you know, in the 40s and whatnot, Sheikh Ante Diop and the rest, because uh, he was just so clear on what this whole colonial project was all about. Uh, there's a book he wrote, Discourse on Colonialism, that has been translated from the French. Very, very clear, very, very brilliant. And then, as I said, he's also a poet and a writer and all the rest. Um, <clears throat> speaking of Touré, Samari Touré, who was uh, easily the most effective fighter against the French in West Africa. And once again, he overran some of the other smaller uh, empires or, or polities, but uh, sometimes what you have to do if you're trying to build enough power to uh, resist someone as powerful as the French were in West Africa, relative to the Africans at the time. Kwame Ture, who is our very own Stokely Carmichael, getting here before the rain. Uh -huh. Kwame Ture, uh, Stokely Carmichael, so we know him. Black Power, of course he's also out of Trinidad. He was able to, uh, Howard University, did all of that. And, and I mentioned earlier, he was even married to Mary McKeever for a while. Uh, you know, when he left the U.S., he went to uh, Guinea, uh, and he changed his name Kwame from Kwame Nkrumah, Ture from Seiko Ture, although the Ture spelling varies. And uh, started All African People's Revolutionary Party, which is uh, still going strong. And uh, our master teachers, master teachers, master teachers who always made themselves available to all of us, yes. all of the time. John Henry Clark out of Alabama, and Yosef Benyakin out of Ethiopia, but together most of the time out of Harlem, New York. And uh, you know, you can research the books that they've written, Black Man in the Nile. Uh, origins of Western civil, African origins, Western civilizations, Western religions, rather. John Henry Clark, um, Africans at the Crossroads, and just dozens of edited works together. Now, everyone always asks me, where is uh, Nobel Prize winner? Mandela. Uh, Nelson Mandela. 
And then they all, no, they asked, where's Mandela? And I said, she's right here. <laughs> well, what about Nelson? Well, he's coming. But we're going to do Winnie first. Yes. <laughs> because uh, once again, talk about sublime madness. You know, somebody under the pressure she was under for as long as she was under that pressure, you know, no, no Nobel Prize for Winnie, no smiles, no, no nothing. Uh, so we're going to give it to her. Yeah. And she died 2018. And people ask me, will I put Nelson? Yeah, I pro you know, what I tell them is I come down about once a week and I ask Winnie, should I do Nelson yet? <laughs> and she said, oh, oh, just hold on. <laughs> so I said, uh, so what I said is, <laughs> well, I'll put him up either when Winnie tells me to or the Africans get their land back in South Africa. Hey. You know, they get their land back, then exactly. we can talk. But right now, exactly. we got Nobel Prize up on the shelf and they still got all the land mm -hmm. and the money. Mm -hmm. And not only they got the land and the money, they, they even polished their name. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They've mm -hmm. even been able to refurbish their mm -hmm. name as, you know, Africans. Mm -hmm. So now we got ShopRite, Glow, uh, what is it? Yeah. Uh, Game. Game and all of these South mm -hmm. African. See, it, it, during the time of apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, we never would have let that stuff come into mm -hmm. other parts of Africa. We said, this South African crap, we're not taking. Mm -hmm. Now we're taking all of that crap mm -hmm. and the whites still own everything. And more. And more. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's terrible what's yes. happened. We've just been hoodwinked and bamboozled. Mm -hmm. Francis Cress Welsing, oh, yes. uh, trying to explain to you what white supremacy is all mm -hmm. about and giving you some realistic, uh, realistic assessment of your chances of this kumbaya moment that you all are hoping for mm -hmm. with the uh, Europeans and their right, wonderful mm -hmm. ethical mm -hmm. heritage. Nope. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, I, I got a question. We got a question right here. Let's see what's going on. My man. Yes, sir. Please, you miss one person. Your dad. Fried left man, Jerry Jones. No, we talked about that. Yes, sir. I, 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 oh, you talked about that. Yes. Don't worry. <laughs> Me, my wife. <way. Okay. laughs> <laughs> so uh, now over here, I, I don't know how tired y'all are, uh -huh. but this is our. The bottom is going to be the library floor. Uh -huh. The middle, which I put those pillars up just a couple of weeks ago, uh -huh. is going to be where I bring the students. Uh -huh. Well, we're just going to have programs like there, not just the students. But every Saturday morning, we're going to bring the students because when I bring them through here. Uh -huh. I don't have anywhere to take it. Right. You know, so Saturday rolls around. I would like to say, okay, you guys come on and we're going to take someone on the wall, go into detail, do a lot more. But I can't really do it like this morning. I can't really do it over here. We're going to do that here. We're also going to have programs for just community adults, all of that stuff. We're going to be showing documentaries. We're going to be showing... We're just going to keep the, keep the funk rolling. You know? mm -hmm. And that's why I put those pillars up there right now because I don't... Now I can take the children up because before I was afraid they were going to jump off. Right. So now all I need is some rails for the stairs. Okay. That's awesome. And we're going to do that. Okay.